you have your Bibles, you can turn to Mark's Gospel this morning, Mark chapter 9, as we get back uh, to our study in uh, this Gospel. I know it's been a long time, uh, so to maybe you read chapters 1 through 8 during the week to kind of catch up, but if not, I'll kind of review a little bit for you. And while you're turning there, the purpose uh, of uh, this Gospel is to basically show people who Jesus Christ is. Uh, Mark Uh, shows us in this gospel that Christ is the sovereign king, that he's the one, uh, the sovereign servant who came to earth with that selfless servant's attitude in order to sacrifice his life for all who would believe. And he writes specifically to a church that was living in a hostile culture. Uh, He writes uh, to show them, in order to encourage them, he shows them who Jesus is. They were facing persecution, they were facing problems, and they needed to encouragement in their lives. Uh, And so in order to encourage them in their pursuit of following Jesus Christ, he writes them, hey, he's worth following. Look, this is who he is. Uh, And and this book centers around two major themes, Jesus, uh, Christology, uh, and discipleship, because the two truths go hand in hand. Uh, The more we see Jesus, the more we get to know him, the more we learn about him, uh, the more faithfully we follow him. And we see those two truths at play in our passage of Scripture this morning. Knowing Jesus Christ fully and seeing him to following him faithfully. Now, when we paused this series back at the beginning of the summer, we saw that Jesus has just given sight to the blind. Uh, and with that miracle, the spiritual blinders have kind of come off the eyes of the disciples. And now everything is kind of clicked for them, and they finally confess that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God. He is the Messiah that they've been waiting for. And the first half of the gospel had really been building uh, to that moment. And so it's uh, a pivotal moment for these followers, because they've been eagerly waiting for the king and the kingdom. And so now they're finally convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt. They already had their beliefs, but now they're confessing it with their mouths. And of course, they're right. They have found the king. And so with the king, though, they're expecting the kingdom. Makes sense. They expected Jesus to wield that kingly authority and power and glory and and to use that to overthrow their political enemies and free them from Roman rule. And of course, with that, they would be Jesus's right-hand men, and they would share in some of that honor and glory. And so as Jesus affirms that confession, they're on cloud nine. That's where they were. But then Jesus kind of pulls the rug out from underneath them. He dashes those expectations, and he teaches them that he's not actually ushering ushering in the kingdom at this time. He's going to suffer, and he's going to die, because sinners need a savior. And so that indicates the kingdom would be on hold, that it would come later. And so the plan was for the cross and then the crown, suffering and then the glory. And you remember Peter took offense to this, right? He's like, you know, not so. This this can't happen, not on my watch. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Right? That's what Jesus said. He, he, gets, he rebukes Peter for this. And then Jesus kind of piles on a little bit afterwards. And he says, well, not only is he going to suffer and die, but his followers must be ready to do the same. He tells them that there's a high cost to following Jesus Christ, and that's at the end of chapter 8. He says it requires more than a great confession, it requires a great commitment. Following Jesus requires a great commitment. And this was difficult for these men to to swallow, because this can't be. Jesus is Lord. He's the King. He's here. He should be exalted, not humiliated, not killed. We shouldn't have to worry about suffering and death, right? We, this, this should not be Jesus. And so this was supposed to be their moment of triumph and victory. And so instead, they're left with some disappointment and some confusion. And, and so at the end of chapter 8, Jesus gives them some motivation for following him. He says, the eternal gain and glory that comes from following him is going to far outweigh any suffering and loss that they would face in this world. And that's what he says. He says, follow me in my plan because no matter what, it will be worth it. You will see and you will experience glory that is unspeakable and unthinkable. And then he goes on in our text today to give them a glimpse of that glory that they would see and experience when he returns to establish his kingdom. So let's look at Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 13 together this morning. 
And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death until they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he didn't know what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly when they had looked around about, they saw no man anymore save Jesus only with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man was risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another, what the rising from the dead should mean. And they asked, saying, Why say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And he answered and told them, Elijah verily cometh first, and restoreth all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be said at naught. But I say unto you that Elijah is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as, as it is written of him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for uh, this time that we can spend together in your word. We thank you for the gift of your word. Uh, and Lord, we thank you for the, the privilege of opening it up. And we would ask that as we look into this text that you would give you and, and ears uh, to hear, that you would open up our hearts to understand what you would have us to see, know, and learn uh, from this passage so that ultimately we would follow you faithfully. Uh, give each one of us the grace that we need and the ability that we need uh, to, to know and understand and, and apply what you have before us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, knowing Jesus fully and seeing him rightly are essential to following him faithfully. And so these men, what they needed was a clearer vision of Jesus Christ so that they could live boldly and they could live confidently for him despite some of the harsh realities that Jesus had given them. And, and you know what? You and I, we need to see the same thing today. We need to see Jesus Christ rightly so that we would follow him faithfully. And so we're going to look at five glorious realities of Christ that we see in this passage. And the first thing that we see in verses 1 through 3 is that Jesus is the glorious king. They were not wrong about this, but we see him in a way that we've never seen him before. And this is some hope for these men, because as I said, their, their hopes had been dashed. Right? Jesus said you can expect suffering. You can expect death. But then he says, but there are some of you who are standing here who are not going to taste death until first you see the kingdom of God coming with power. Now, what does that mean? Well, Jesus is not saying that, well, I'm going to establish the kingdom now, because clearly that didn't happen, right? I mean, these men died, the kingdom hasn't been established, and Jesus is not ruling and reigning on the throne of David at this point. So this has caused some skeptics to say, see, Jesus, Jesus doesn't even know what he's talking about. We can't trust him, but that's not what Jesus is saying here. Now, what is he saying? Well, the word kingdom is kind of one of the keys to our understanding here. And that's sometimes used to describe something that's associated with the kingdom. Kind of like how sometimes we use Washington to describe uh, the Federal Reserve, or, or the federal government, I mean. Uh, we might say, Washington did this, or, or Washington uh, said that. No, Washington didn't. The government did, or the government decided to do, to do this. And that's kind of how uh, the word kingdom was used. It would, speak, it would speak of royal majesty, splendor. Splend, yeah, splendor. I want to make sure I didn't say splenda. Um, I practiced it too, but uh, that's associated with the kingdom. And that fits this context where Jesus is saying to his disciples that some of you are going to see the power, the glory, the majesty that is associated with my return. And you're going to see it before you die. And every single uh, Gospel writer that includes the transfiguration, the three synoptics, they have it in this context, right? He says those words, and then the transfiguration happens. Clearly, they understood this is what he's talking about. He's not talking about bringing in his earthly kingdom at this point. He's talking about giving them a sneak preview, right? The trailer to a movie, right? And then in the trailer of the movie, they show you the best parts. Like, yeah, I want to see that. And then you go see the movie, and it's like, 
the trailer was better um, because they gave you all the saying, this is what's to come. Only it's going to be even greater than anything you're seeing. And, and so that's what he's doing here. He's giving him this preview. He's talking about this, this is what's going to happen. And you're going to get to see him in his majesty, in all of his glory. And, and that's exactly what happens. And that's exactly what they needed to see here. Because, as I said, they're kind of reeling at this point. They don't know what to think. And so look at verse 2. And so after six days, it says, Jesus takes with him Peter and James and John. These are the inner circle. These are his closest uh, followers. They get to witness the raising of Jairus' daughter, and now they get to see this. And so he leads them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and it says he was transfigured before them. Now Luke tells us that they go up to this mountain to pray, which is common for Jesus, right? He was all about prayer. Uh, and this was not out of the ordinary. And I don't know if the disciples knew what was going to happen here. It tells us that they fell asleep. Right? I mean, clearly they didn't expect him to, to display the, the glorious greatness that he's about to show them because they get to the top of the mountain, and what do they do? Jesus is praying, and they do their thing. They fall asleep. And it says in Luke, was sleep. And again, that goes back to what we were just talking about. They're worn down. That's what that word means. They were burdened emotionally. I think we understand this, don't we? Have you ever been at that point where you're, you're stressed, you're discouraged, uh, and all you feel like doing is, is sleeping? There's just too much on your heart and your mind, and, and you can't think of anything else to do except, I just want to take a nap. That's where these disciples were. They've been through the ringer for the last couple of weeks. They had that aha moment, like they were on top of the world, and then... It was all dashed to pieces when Jesus says, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die, and you need to prepare, be prepared to do the same. And so they just can't handle this. They can't handle life at this moment, and so they were heavy with sleep. They want relief, and I think we've probably been there. But Jesus didn't bring them up there to escape reality by taking a nap. He brought them up there so they could witness his glory, because that's what they need more than a nap. They need to see the glory of Jesus Christ so that their hearts and their minds could be changed, so that they could be energized, so that they could be... so that they could have hope for their future, and so that they could become more faithful followers of Him. And that's what you and I need as well. We need to see Jesus Christ as the glorious King, which is exactly what He shows His followers here. And He gives them uh, of something that they've never seen before. It says they was transfigured before them. That means change. It's our English word metamorphosis. It means a radical transformation. We use the word to describe the, the caterpillar changing into a, a butterfly. Now, of course, Jesus can't change who he is. He can't. This is more of an unveiling. Jesus is kind of pulling back the curtain on exactly who he is. Because up to this point, they have never seen anything like this. One writer describes this as the most significant event between Christ's birth. I mean, they've seen Jesus do some powerful and amazing things. Right? They've seen his works, they've seen his authority, they've seen the evidence that he's no ordinary man, which led to that confession of theirs. And we've seen it along with them as we've studied this book. Right? We've seen him heal the sick, we've seen him make the lame walk, cast out demons, feed thousands of people twice, calm storms, give sight to the blind. We've even seen him raise the dead. And he's spoken words of authority like no one has ever spoken before or ever will speak again. Power and authority. But if you looked at him, you just saw a man. His appearance suggested that he was just a regular, ordinary Jewish man. But we know in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead seen in his appearance. And Mark Twain's The Prince and the Pauper sort of illustrates this a little bit if you've ever read it. It's a, it's a fictitious story about Edward VI, who was the young prince of Wales. He trades places with a poor pauper named Tom Canty. And they kind of meet each other, and they realize that they look exactly alike, and no one would ever know the difference. And, and as a prince, he's kind of longing to experience, this is not what Jesus is doing, but um, this prince was longing to experience what life is like outside the palace, like a regular person. And so he exchanges his royal clothing, puts on the rags of the pauper. He leaves the majesty, splendor of the palace, and he goes outside. And then he finds that he's treated like a pauper. He's beaten. 
He's mocked. He's laughed at. And then when he insists that he's the prince, he's driven into the streets of of London where he gets treated even worse. They call him insane and they actually give him a mock coronation. Yeah, sure you're the king. Sounded all familiar. He was the prince. But all the people could see was a boy in the dirty, worn clothes of a pauper. And that's kind of what happened with Jesus. I wonder where Mark Twain get his idea. Jesus steps into creation. He takes on humanity. He is the eternal son of God. He's the majestic creator. He's the Messiah. He's the prince of peace who clothes himself in the rags of humanity in order to enter this world to save sinners. In doing that, of course, he never stopped being God. He never lost an ounce of his deity. He continued to be the king of kings, the son of God. But all of that was veiled in a human nature. And because of that, what did people see? They saw an ordinary man, a regular Jewish carpenter. Nothing in fact, Isaiah says it this way. He says, he had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him. Even the people closest to him saw an ordinary individual, a regular member of society. His neighbors saw him as the carpenter's son. We know, we know the family. He's just one of them. His brothers thought he was crazy because he just didn't look like God despite his power, despite his authority. He didn't look like a king. So why would we treat him like a king? To look at him, you would not know that this was God incarnate. Just looks like my neighbor. And he was treated that way. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. People were offended by his claims. They hated him. But we know that Jesus is so much more than that. We read in Hebrews 1.3 that he is the radiance of the glory of God. But no one on earth had ever seen him this way. Because he graciously veiled that glory in Bethlehem by taking on that perfect humanity. And just to think, if he didn't veil that glory, anybody who came into contact with him would have been consumed. We can't stand in the fullness of the glory of God. And so here Jesus pulls back the curtain for these, for these three men, for his inner circle, so that they could see what nobody has ever seen before. And he allows them to see it without being consumed. And this, this incident is, is so similar to what we read in Exodus. Chapter 24, in verses 13 and following, Moses rises up with with Joshua. Moses went up into the mountain of God, and then it says he went up on that mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain, and the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. He called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of that mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Here is something very similar. We see the glorious brightness of, description that Mark gives. He he does the best he can here, but he can't really fully describe it because who can? In in verse 3, it says, his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. That's it. Don't you wish he kind of elaborated a little bit more? Give me more here. I, I want more. So, you know, I looked, I did want more. So I looked at Matthew's account and Luke's account. There's a very similar Matthew says he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And Luke says, and as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. Again, very similar, but not enough details. But how do you describe something like this? What I say is we have indescribable glory here. They can't even put it into words more than this. In the Old Testament, we see uh, that God displays himself as light. And that's what Jesus is doing. The Shekinah glory is, is here. It's radiant. It's overwhelming. And it's indescribable. It's hard to put it into words. It's how do you describe the brightness of the sun? I, I don't just suggest you do it, but you can go outside and you can look at the, at the sun and then come back and, and describe it. What do you see? No, I don't see anything now because I just looked at the sun. It's intense. It's hard to look at. In fact, when we were out there singing on that white paper, I came in and I couldn't see a thing. And that's kind of what they have here. This is so bright. And and, and so Mark tries. He says his his raiment was shining. It was white as snow, whiter than snow. And that's that's pretty white. 
I can't imagine brighter than that. I mean, we painted our, our deck white at first, and then we decided that's not a good idea because the sun would beat on it, and you look out the window, and you went blind. I, I feel like that's kind of what they're seeing here. And, and then he says, uh, it's so white that even the, the dry cleaner couldn't get them this white. That's what a fuller is. It's somebody who bleached clothes. You watch baseball or, or football and have those white uniforms and white, and you're like, what do they use? I mean, I don't say that, but Valerie said that. <laughs> It's like, how do they get them so white? Well, Mark's saying Jesus' raiments, they were whiter than this. No dry cleaner, not even tie, not even bleach could get them this white. And so this is at this moment. He's bursting forth with this blazing glory. And they've never seen anything like this. Nobody has seen anything like this. I mean, they've seen Jesus do some amazing things, but they've never seen anything like what they see right now. Luke 9, 32 adds, they saw his glory. That's what they saw. They're witnessing the glory of Jesus Christ. The apostle John, who doesn't actually describe this event, he says in in John 1, 14, speaking of this, I'm sure, he says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And then he says, we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We saw it, he says. We saw his glory. The glory of God is the reality that he is greater. He is more valuable, more majestic, more glorious than anything we could ever conceive of. And these men are given a glimpse of that glory. They are seeing that he is the God who dwells in unapproachable light. In Psalm 104, verses 1 and 2, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. And that's what they're seeing here. That's what they're seeing, that, that this is who they see Jesus as, now the glorious king, clothed with majesty, clothed with light. And as I said, Jesus has always had this glory, but it has been veiled to the world until this point. And he only unveils it to this select few in this moment so that they can see him rightly because they needed to see this if they were going to follow boldly, confidently, and faithfully to their own deaths. They needed to see the glory of Jesus Christ and he gives it to them because Jesus Christ is the glorious king. And then we go on we see not only is he the glorious king, but he's greater than the law and the prophets. In verse 4, there appeared unto them Elijah with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. Now, all of a sudden, we see that Jesus is not alone on this mountain with his three disciples. Now, how these men knew and Moses is beyond me. That's a good question. I guess you can ask them when we, when we get to heaven. How did you know? Maybe we'll know. Maybe we'll get there. Oh, that's how they knew. Gotcha. Maybe they were wearing name tags. Hello, my name is Moses. Doubt it. Or they introduced them. I don't know. Somehow it was obvious that they recognized which is also means that we will recognize, I and mean, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, but that we will recognize one another in glory. Right? Some people are like, will we know each other? Will we, will we understand? Yeah, well, they knew Moses and Elijah. They had never met, and they knew them. So I would assume that we who have met each other will know each other in glory. So why are Moses and Elijah here? Who invited them to this uh, prayer meeting? Well, there are a number of thoughts, but the majority of scholars that I read believe that these men are here because they best represent the Old Testament, the Old Testament law and the prophets. The law and the prophets was a shorthand way of describing the Old Testament. And so these two men represent that. Moses, though, is obvious, right? I mean, when you think of the law, you think, you also think the law of Moses, right? He was the great lawgiver. He's synonymous with the law. And he was also seen as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, leader in the history of Israel. He led the exodus. There's no one better to testify than the glory of Christ than he. Other than maybe Elijah. Elijah represents the prophets better than any other prophet. He defended the law of God. He fought against idolatry, pointing them back to God. Now, when you and I think of Old Testament prophets, maybe we don't think of Elijah. We think of Isaiah or somebody like that, one of the the writing prophets. But for the Jewish men, their mind went straight to Elijah. 
There was no prophet of God more fascinating than him. And no one exemplified the office quite the way that he did. So for the Jewish audience, they would have gone that. They would have gone there. I mean, you remember in James when he talks about prayer, he points out Elijah. Because Elijah held a high place in the hearts of Jewish people. And so what we have here in this this appearance of these men, that Jesus Christ is the glorious king that the Old Testament points to. He's the one who is greater than the law and the prophets. He is the one who fulfills the law and the prophets. He's the one that they anticipate. He's the Messiah. He's the king. Remember, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17, don't think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I've not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. And he is the great fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And then by, by being there and then fading off the scene in verse 8, right, when, when suddenly they looked around and, and no one else was there but only Jesus, this is a visual testimony that Jesus Christ stands alone in his greatness. He stands alone in his glory. Nobody else even comes close to the glory and honor that Jesus Christ deserves. He is the one to be worshipped. He is the one to be followed. He is the one to be adored. He is the glorious king. He's the, the, the great fulfiller of the law and the prophets, and he's the great deliverer. It tells us uh, here in, in verse 4 that they were talking with Jesus. And it's written in a way that they, they were talking for a while. Now, wouldn't you like to know what they were talking about? Maybe you already know. It wasn't politics. It wasn't weather. It wasn't sports either. Maybe they talked a little bit of sports. No, I'm just kidding. We don't have to guess what they were talking about. Luke tells us in Luke 9, 30 and 31, it says, Behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. And that word departure is literally the word exodus. They weren't talking about Moses' exodus. They were talking about the exodus of Christ in Jerusalem. Any idea what he's talking about? That's the crucifixion, right? They're talking about Christ's death on the cross, that he was going to the cross, that he was going to die, that he was going to accomplish a than Moses accomplished. Right? The cross was going to lead people out of slavery, but, but not just slavery uh, to a, a human uh, oppressor, but slavery to sin. And he was going to lead them into a right relationship with all God. And to do that, he would suffer and die in Jerusalem. And he would be raised three days later. This, what they're saying, is the plan. This has been the plan all along. You have Moses and Elijah testifying to that. This was not a blip on the radar. This was not a plan B from God. God knew. Right? You remember the disciples, they're like, I don't think so. I I don't get suffering and death in the Old Testament. I see glory and, and kingdom and power. And what you have here is the two greatest men in their eyes, the the two that represent the Old Testament, testifying that Jesus is going to the cross. Isaiah 53, right? That's in the Old Testament. But very few Jewish people picked up on that. And so what they're talking about is Jesus is going to the the cross. He is going to suffer. He is going to die, just like he's been telling his So they're testifying of this, that this is part of the plan. This had to happen because... In order for sinners to be saved, in order for us to be forgiven, we need a substitute. We need somebody to save us and save us. And uh, and that's what Jesus is going to do. He came to seek and to save the lost by dying in our place to free us. And that meant going to the cross. And so that's what they're talking about. They're talking about that Jesus is the great deliverer, that he will die for sinners. And it's not an accident. This was according to the foreknowledge of God that this is going to happen. And so that's what they're talking about. And so the three disciples, they're dumbfounded by what they see and what they hear. I don't know if they heard everything that he was talking about. But they're definitely in awe. It's too marvelous for words, what they're seeing here, but that never stops Peter from opening his mouth, does it? I mean, you know, there are, there are times when, when he probably should have kept his mouth shut, and this is one of those times, but that never stops Peter. So it says in verse 5, Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. You think? You, you think so, Peter? Yeah, it's good for you to be here. Maybe he should have stopped there. 
And so then he says, uh, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. For he didn't know what to say, for they were sore afraid. And so Peter speaks because he's in awe. He's exhilarated, but at the same time, he's terrified. I don't know what to do. He's mixed with fear, wonder, amazement. And he probably shouldn't have said anything. Right? You've heard the saying, better to remain silent and be thought of a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Right? That's maybe what should have happened here. But we love Peter because he's relatable. Right? Sometimes you just open your mouth and you go, oops, I shouldn't have said that. And so he says, you know, it's good for us to be here. And it is right. It was good for them to be here. That's why Jesus brought them there. Because they needed to see what they saw. But he goes on. He, his mouth keeps going. And then he says, let's make three tabernacles. Let's, let's make three tents. Let's make three booths. One for you. Or one for Moses. One for Elijah. I don't know if he's trying to impress people or what. But let's, let's get all of you here. Why? Well, perhaps he's thinking that they're all on par with Jesus, which obviously is foolish. This, this vision wasn't about Moses and Elijah. It's about Christ. And they don't compare to Jesus Christ, and we'll see that in a minute. But also, many scholars believe that the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, was taking place at this time, so that might have been on his mind. Now, what was the, the Feast of Tabernacles? That was a, a feast that memorialized the exodus from Egypt, but it also looked forward to the coming of the king and his kingdom. In Ezekiel 37, 27, it says, when that kingdom comes, it says, my tabernacle also shall be with them. I will be the people. So Peter may be seeing, hey, the king is here. The lawgiver is here. The forerunner to the king is here. Let's do this now. Let's, let's set the kingdom up right now. We have all the, uh, the major players here, so let's just Let's just do this. Let's just build booze. Let's build these tabernacles. This doesn't have to end. Let's just stay here. Which, I mean, I think you can understand that a little bit, right? Jesus in all of his glory. I don't want this to end. So let's, let's stay here. Let's, let's just be here. Skip the resurrection. Let's skip the suffering and the, the dying. And let's make this a reality now. Whether Peter knew that or not, or meant to, that's kind of what he's saying. If we stay here, then the cross doesn't happen. The suffering doesn't happen. I mean, Peter's kind of hung up on that. So some people think maybe that's what he's suggesting here. But that's not the plan. Yes, Jesus is the glorious king. Yes, he is the God who will dwell with his people. He is the one who will rule and reign, but he's also the great deliverer. And the cross is part of it. And so the kingdom would come, but not yet. Jesus would first have to suffer. He would first have to go to the cross and then be raised to lead sinners out of their sin. And then the glory would come when he returns. But Peter doesn't want this to end. But God has different plans, plans for Christ to go to the cross. And so Peter seems to be missing the point of this event. And so then we have God the Father stepping in, and he testifies of the glory of Jesus. And then he gives us the purpose of all this in, in verses 7 and 8 as well. And But before that, Jesus the glorious king, uh, the great fulfiller of the, the law and the prophets, and the great deliverer, but he's also the beloved son. So, so Peter's talking here about, hey, let's just stay here. Let's, let's do this, this kingdom thing now. And in verse 7, and a cloud overshadowed them. Who is that? That's the father. And a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, guess who was gone? Moses and Elijah. They no longer saw anyone with them, but, but only Jesus. Essentially, the father's saying, I, I got to put, put a stop to this. That's enough, Peter. Be quiet. <laughs> Let me have... Notice the only people that, uh, that it tells us what they say are, are Peter and, and the father here. And so the father's going to say, okay, this is what you need to hear. This is my beloved son. And this is the same statement that the father makes when Jesus is baptized right before he began his earthly ministry. And the statement he has with the Son, that it's a unique one, that the love between them is, is unlike anything else. It speaks of, of Christ being that unique, one-of-a-kind Son, like no other in the eyes of the Father. It also speaks of the Son's privilege, His power, His glory. It's, it's a term of, of kingship and, 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 and glory and honor. And, and Jesus, again, is no ordinary human being. 
He's the eternal beloved Son of God, which means He's majestic and above all else, which is why He says, listen to Him. This is how the writer of Hebrews uses it. He, right, he's making the case in the, in the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ is greater, that He's greater than anything else you could ever imagine. Uh, the angels, the, the prophets, the, the old covenant, uh, Moses, all of that. And so in relation to the angels, he says, For unto which of the angels did he at any time say, Thou art my son? This day I have begotten thee. And the answer is not. He never said that to anyone else. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, he bringeth in the first begotten unto the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And that's essentially what he's saying here. This is my beloved son. He alone is worthy of glory and honor. He alone is worthy of worship. Honor him, not Moses, not Elijah, not your plans, not not your agenda, disciples. Listen to him. He says, this is my beloved son. He alone is worthy. He alone is supreme. I heard somebody say, I didn't really get a chance to process it, but God is only impressed by Jesus Christ. That's kind of what this says. Peter's impressed with Moses and Elijah, right? Hey, let's make a booth for them too. And sometimes we impress ourselves, but God is Jesus Christ. And we're impressed if to him when we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. It's on his merits, not our own. The Father is impressed by Jesus, and that's what he says here. Jesus only. Jesus is the glorious king. He's greater than the great deliverer. He's the beloved son, and he's the final authority. All of this adds up to point number five, that he is the final authority. The eternal, unique, and one-of-a-kind son, the glorious king, who clothed himself with humanity, who fulfilled the law and the prophets, who came to die in our place to deliver us out of our sins is the one that we must look to. He's the one that we must listen to. So what he says is and what he says goes. And that's what he says here. That's what God the Father says. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Moses and Elijah are gone. They faded away. They are not even close to the same level as Jesus Christ. They can't compare to him. So listen to him. Moses said these same words back in Deuteronomy 18. Verse 15, he says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of you, of your brother, like unto me. Unto him you, will, you shall listen, you shall hearken. And this is the point. Jesus Christ is the glorious king. He's the Lord of lords. There is no one higher. There is no one greater. So we must listen to him. He's the preeminent one. In other words, he's saying to these three disciples, you see his glory now. You see it clearly like no one else has ever seen. Now it is time to listen to him. It's time to obey him. And that's what that word means, hear him. It's not just hearing the words and then going and doing my own thing like sometimes we do. Okay, that's the Bible, that's what it says, but I'm still going to do it my way because I don't like this or it's hard to submit. That's what Peter and the disciples were, right? I hear your words, what you're saying. I don't like that you're going to the cross. He says, no. This is Jesus, you listen to him. I don't care what he says, you listen to him. And that's what he's giving his disciples here. And that's what he's giving us. We look to Jesus Christ and we submit to Jesus Christ. And this is how Peter applies it in his, his letter in 2 Peter. In, verses, uh, in chapter 1, verses 16 through 21, we listen to the word of God. He says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables. And he's talking about this event when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw it on that mountain. Right? We saw the glory with our own eyes, he says. We, and he says, we heard the testimony of the Father. He says, we received, in verse 17, from the God the Father, honor and glory, when there came such a voice. Him from that excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And he says, and this is the voice which came from heaven we heard. And we were there with him in that holy mount. And then he goes on and he says something incredible, which this is for a different sermon, but he says, we now have something more reliable. More reliable than experience, he says. Even though we've experienced this, this, this incredible moment on the Mount of Transfiguration, we have something more trustworthy in the Scriptures. 
And he says, don't take our word for it. Take God's word for it. Look to the scriptures. He says, we have a more sure word in verse 19. Whereunto, he says, you do well that you take heed. Same application. These men saw the glory of God, the glory of Jesus Christ on that mountain. We see the glory of God, the glory of Jesus Christ in this book. Right? We may say, oh man, it must have been great to be on that mountain. Well, Peter says we have something more sure right here. Right at our fingertips. Do we open it up? Do we act like the disciples on that mountain? Are we in awe by Jesus Christ as he pictures himself for us in this book? No, I don't think we are. Like, oh, I got a Bible, but I never read it. Why? The glory of God is in this book. His words are right here. We don't have to go looking for an experience. Peter says, you have a more sure word. And yet we scroll to Facebook, uh, we watch the TV, the social media, we get more of our information from that than God's word. We have God's glory. Shame on us for not looking at it. I wish I could get something new from God. We'll master this first. That's what God wants from you and me. He wants to see his glory. He wants us to obey his word. He wants us to submit to this. He says, it is the word of God. It's only in the scriptures that we are going to see the revealed glory of Jesus Christ. And so he says, this is the revelation of my son. Listen to him. So he says, listen to him when he says, Whoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Listen to him when he says that. Not, well, I don't like that. Listen to him when he says, I am the way, the truth. No one comes to the Father but by me. Listen to him when he says that. Salvation is by him alone. Listen to him when he says, don't be anxious about your life. Yeah, but who's going to take care of me? God is. Listen to him when he says, store up your treasures in heaven. When he says, love God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind. When he says, love your neighbor as yourself. When he says, love your enemy. When he says, let your light shine. Listen to him. Obey him. That's what this text is telling us. Listen to him when he says, make disciples. Well, that's for somebody else. No, he says, all of his followers, listen to him. Listen to him when he says, you are loved. When he says, you are forgiven. When he says, you are his child. Listen to him. When he says, there is therefore no... Now, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen to him and believe it. Look to him and listen to him. I've heard it said that we often treat Jesus like British monarchy. He's elevated Lord. We have a special place for him, but he doesn't actually rule our lives. We give him lip service, but we don't submit to his authority. He is the glorious king. He is the Lord of lords. We are to listen to him above all else. Are you? Am I? Are we looking to Jesus Christ and are we listening to him? Who is ruling your life if it's not Jesus? Jesus says in Luke 6, 46, and I go back to this, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do the things that I say? Is that the question that Jesus is asking you this morning? Who are you listening to? Who are you submitting to? Who are you obeying? And who will you follow? Who will you submit to this week? Your feelings, the news, your friends, your coworkers, or will it be Jesus Christ? God says, this is my beloved son. This is the glorious king. Listen to him. We need to see him as he is, know him rightly so that we will follow him faithfully. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given us a more sure word in scripture. Lord, we can look at this this event in the life of of these three men and we can say, oh man, I, I would love to have been there. But in your word, you tell us that we have something more sure than even that event. In your word. Father, help us to... Help us to understand that. Help us to look to your word with the desire to see your glory. But not just to to stay there and look to that glory, but, but help us then live out the words that you command to us so that we would reflect that glory. 
so that people would look at us and they would say, well, what's different about them? Why are they so loving? Why are they so joyful? And then we could give the reason. Father, help us with this. Help us to look to you and listen to you and submit to you above all else so that you would receive all glory and all honor because you deserve it. You are worthy of all of that. Father, I ask that you dismiss us with your grace and your blessing uh, today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.